Welcome all to Merton College for this service of choral evensong on this, the third Sunday before Lent. Offer the sacrifice of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Dearly beloved brethren, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we most chiefly so to do when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary as well for the body as the soul. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying after me. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now sit as the choir sings the psalmody, Psalm 4.
The first lesson is written in the prophecy of Amos, chapter 2. Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Judah, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because they have rejected the law of the Lord, and have not kept his statutes. But they have been led astray by the same lies after which their ancestors walked. So I will send a fire on Judah, and it shall devour the strongholds of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because they, send, they sell the righteous for silver, and the needy for a pair of sandals. They who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth, and push the afflicted out of the way. Father and son go in to the same girl, so that my holy name is profaned. They lay themselves down beside every altar, on garments taken in pledge, and in the house of their God they drink wine bought with fines they imposed. Yet I destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of cedars, and who was as strong as oaks. I destroyed his fruit above, and his roots beneath. Also I brought you up out of the land of Egypt, and led you for forty years in the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. And I raised up some of your children to be prophets, and some of your youths to be Nazarites. Is it not indeed so, O people of Israel, says the Lord? But you made the Nazarites drink wine, and commanded the prophets, saying, You shall not prophesy. So, I will press you down in your place, just as a cart presses down when it is full of sheaves, flight shall perish from the swift, and the strong shall not retain their strength, nor shall the mighty save their lives. Those who handle the bow shall not stand, and those who are swift of foot shall not save themselves, nor shall those who ride horses save their lives, and those who are stout of heart among the mighty shall flee away naked on that day, says the Lord. Here ends the first lesson.
The second lesson is written in the letter of Paul to the Ephesians, chapter 4. Now this I affirm and insist on in the Lord. You must no longer live as the Gentiles live, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance and hardness of heart. They have lost all sensitivity and have abandoned themselves to licentiousness, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. That is not the way you learned Christ, for surely you have heard about him and were taught in him as truth is in Jesus. You were taught to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its lusts, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to clothe yourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Here ends the second lesson.
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy name is in heaven, thy name will be done, on our earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but us deliver us from evil. If you turn to pages 16 and 17 of the booklets, you'll find the schedule of services for this week and also some other notices. Next Sunday evening, our preacher at the Eucharist is the former Archbishop of Canterbury and visitor of the college, Bishop Rowan Williams. Service begins at the usual Sunday time of 5.45. Our chapel charity this term is Young Minds, a mental health charity working with children and young people. You'll find the collection plate in the anti-chapel as you move through after the service. 
It's a very great pleasure to welcome to the College this evening the Right Honourable Ben Bradshaw. Ben is the Member of Parliament for Exeter, a constituency he served since he was first elected there in 1997. We very much look forward to your address this evening, Ben, and there will be an opportunity for us to meet him and one another over a drink in the Anti Chapel after the service. This evening's anthem is a setting of words from the first letter of Peter Blessed be the God and Father. The music by Samuel Sebastian Wesley.
Let us pray. Let all of us speak the truth to our neighbours, for we are members of one another. Let us pray for all people in positions of power, especially for all members of Parliament. May they have the wisdom to discern God's will and the courage to carry it out and to fight for justice for all people. Let us also pray for the poor and marginalised, that decisions may be made to benefit them so that just as we are all equal before God, we might all be equal here on earth. Lord, the God of righteousness and truth, grant to all people in positions of responsibility the guidance of your spirit. May they never lead the nation wrongly through love of power, desire to please, or unworthy ideals, but laying aside all private interests and prejudices, keep in mind their responsibility to seek to improve the condition of all mankind. So may your kingdom come and your name be hallowed through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up. Let us pray for all who work to build up Christ's church. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, and for an increase to vocations, to lay and ordained roles. We pray especially for General Synod, praying for fruitful discussions and for decisions made prayerfully in love and faith. Gracious God, from love we are made and to love we shall return. May our love for one another kindle flames of joy and hope. May the light and warmth of your grace inspire us to follow the way of Jesus Christ and serve you in your kingdom now and forever. Amen. Amen. In a moment of silence, we bring before God the thoughts and prayers of our own hearts. We unite all of our prayers and petitions in the words of the grace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. We stand to sing the hymn, O oh, for a Closer Walk with God.
thank you for inviting me to this glorious service and thank you for your beautiful music and for your prayers. I would rather the Church of England were disestablished than lose Conservatives in the worldwide Anglican Communion. Those are the words of the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, just last week at a meeting with the cross-party group of parliamentarians who'd asked to see him following the recent statement by the Church of England bishops on same-sex relationships. When I was asked here and agreed to come, uh, I was filled with the same trepidation I always feel when in a weak moment I agree to preach in church. Because I'm not a priest nor a theologian. I'm a politician who happens to be Anglican and married to my partner of 28 years who is a man. I don't know if it was brilliant foresight of your chaplain Simon to invite me here on this particular Sunday, but we happen to be facing one of those periodic crises in the relations between church and state, in which as a member of Parliament's ecclesiastical committee, I find myself unavoidably in the middle. And unless you've just come back from a month's silent retreat or don't consume any news, I don't need to tell you that the Church of England's Parliament, the General Synod, meets this coming week to discuss the outcome of nearly seven years of deliberation on same-sex relationships. Three weeks ago, the bishops published a paper recommending that parishes should be free to conduct prayers of blessing for same-sex couples, but not marriage. And the blessings proposed would be of the individuals, not their relationship. The further issue of gay and lesbian clergy and the current rules which prevent them from marrying and require them to be celibate will be discussed further down the line and brought back in July. This package was a bitter disappointment to many Anglicans, including me, who were hoping for more substantial change. But for some conservative evangelicals and traditional Anglo-Catholics, even these proposals go too far. And it's by no means certain that they'll be approved by Synod this week. A few parishes have already stopped contributing to their local diocesan funds, and some have said they will leave the Church of England completely if the changes are approved. Now, people who don't know as much as I'm sure you all do about the Church of England and its peculiar status and its history may ask themselves what any of this has got to do with Parliament. But as I'm sure you do know, the Church of England origi originated in the marital troubles of a former king and was created by parliamentary statute. Until 1919, all Church of England legislation was considered and approved, or otherwise, by Parliament. But partly because of the time burden that placed on Parliament, and also because of frustration in the Church about the slow progress of ecclesiastical legislation through Parliament, we agreed to hand over that job to a newly formed Anglican Assembly, which later became the General Synod. But Parliament retained a block by insisting all Church of England legislation must still be debated and approved in the first instance by the Ecclesiastical Committee of MPs and Peers, and if need be, on the floor of both houses. The role of Second Church of State's Commissioner was created. He or she, as a member of Parliament of the governing party, appointed by the Crown on the advice of the Prime Minister. They act like a kind of unpaid minister for the Church of England, answering questions in Parliament on behalf of the Church, steering Church legis legislation through Parliament, and conveying Parliament's views to the Church. A previous holder of this office, the former Conservative MP for Banbury, just up the road, Sir Tony Baldry, told another meeting of MPs this week to discuss this issue, that when the 1999 Act was passed, handing Synod the role previously conducted by Parliament, nobody had really envisaged a situation in which Parliament and the Church might disagree for any length of time on a major matter of doctrine and practice. But as social mores in society and in the Church change, particularly after the Second World War, there have been several occasions when there's been a standoff between Church and State leading to a change in the doctrine and practices of the church. On the treatment of people who are divorced, for example, as social attitudes towards marriage and divorce changed, it became not uncommon for priests and parishes to have in their congregation people whose marriages had broken down. They may also have been what used to be called the innocent party, but they still found themselves ostracized in the parish, and were they to fall in love and wish to marry again, 
they could not do so. The more recent example we have was over the role of women in the church and their right to become priests and then bishops. In both of these matters, Parliament took the view before the church itself did that things needed to change. The church, very conscious and protective of its role as an established church, did change. And we have the situation we have today that parishes are now free to marry divorcees and women can thankfully become priests and bishops, but not everywhere yet. So are we at that point now when it comes to sexual orientation? An opinion poll in yesterday's Times found clear majorities both among Anglicans in England and among the public in general who would support parishes being allowed to conduct same-sex wedding, weddings, but not being forced to. So a similar model to that affecting divorcees and women. When MPs debated this two weeks ago after the bishop's statement, a clear majority of those from all parties who spoke said they didn't believe the bishop's proposals go far enough. It's not a generally a theological argument around human sexual relationships that exercises parliamentarians most. We are not theologians. And if you accept, as I do, <clears throat> that there are theologians on both sides of the argument with sincerely held views, you'd better leave the theological debate to them. For parliamentarians, this is about politics and the nation state. MPs, including those who are not Anglicans, care deeply about the Church of England because it has such a central role in the life and constitution of the nation. We cannot avoid interacting with the Church of England in our constituencies, whether we would like to or not. And my judgment is that because of this, most parliamentarians greatly value the role the Church plays in our national and local lives. There's something about having a servant church that's there for everyone because it is established that is precious. When there's some local tragedy or calls for celebration, it's in my local cathedral in Exeter or in somebody else's local parish church that the doors are opened and the community is welcomed. Hence the shock and surprise among those MPs present, who included me, at the Archbishop's comments last week. If the church were not established, it could do whatever it likes within the law. But most MPs are of the view now that there is a fundamental problem with an established church remaining opposed to something that's been the law of the land for 10 years, and by doing so, actively discriminating against one group in the nation, the whole of which the church purports to serve. The church's current position is made more difficult to defend by the fact that Anglicans in Scotland and several other Anglican provinces can already marry in church. And the church's own mission statement outlines how it plans and aims to grow, particularly among, eth my, uh, my, among minorities and young people, when I would suggest that most young people find its position on same-sex relationships completely incomprehensible. So we do have a problem. Perhaps Justin Welby is right. The church does have to choose, if not this week, then soon. And depending on the outcome of the Synod, I expect Parliament will consider weighing up its options. MPs don't want to instruct the church, but do, I sense, want to encourage and cajole it forward. They cannot see how it can remain established and continue to discriminate. Most of my colleagues would not wish to see the church disestablished, but equally we don't see how it can continue to enjoy the privileges of establishment without fulfilling the duty to serve everyone. So the Archbishop may choose disestablishment over upsetting the Conservatives in the worldwide Anglican Communion, but Parliament would, I believe, choose establishment and reform. The Archbishop would favour defending the fragile unity of the worldwide Anglican Communion at all costs. Parliament is concerned about the unity in these islands and the Church's primary duty to minister here. Whatever is agreed or not in Synod this week, it will probably not be the end of the matter. If left unresolved, we're likely to come back to it again and again. And that's a shame, particularly if, like me, you think there are so many other things the Church could be focusing on. So please continue to pray for your bishops, your clergy and your lay representatives on Synod, that their debate this week will be passionate but civilised, and chart a course forward that can both preserve this eccentric, but precious institution, while keeping the maximum number of people on board with its journey. Amen.
we stand to sing the final hymn. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you always. In memoria eterna erit justus. Justorum anime in manu dei sunt. Domine Deus, resurrectuit vita credentium, qui semper es laudandus tami viventibus, 
quam in defunctis, agimus tibi gratias, profunditore nostro Waltero de Merton, ceterisque benefactoribus nostris, quorum beneficius hic ad pietatem et studia literarum alimo. Rogantes, ut nosis donis sat tuam gloriam recte utentes, una cum illis ad resurrectionis gloriam immortalem peducamo, per Christum, Dominum Nostrum. <laughs>